five years, is it's sort of like doing a cross uh, a jigsaw puzzle. Now, um, you know, back in, in the 50s and 60s, we didn't have the Internet. We didn't have a lot of things that people have today. We did jigsaw uh, puzzles. And to do a jigsaw puzzle, you just dump everything out of the box and you turn everything up upright so you can see that. And then you start doing, finding the flat edges. And I used to do a lot of jigsaw puzzles, and I could do them really, really quick. Um, there was a challenge that I had is to do a jigsaw puzzle without looking at the box. Say the box was a, a barn with a little pond and two people there and the blue sky and the white clouds, etc. Well, looking at the box, you could find, pick up a piece and put things in. This whole thing that I've been doing is like doing a jigsaw puzzle. I'm putting pieces in and seeing the picture of the future, the future of the United States, the future of the world, based upon all the facts and the information that have, have been given to me. And in the process of doing this, I began having these thoughts in my mind. Well, this is probably going to happen, and that's going to probably happen. And when those things did, as I saw the picture clear, I, I didn't think of myself as a prophet in the way that, that, that people think of prophets today, like a religious prophet or even Nostradamus and quatrains and all this sort of stuff. I just thought, man, I'm putting things together, and, it's, and I can see into the future by just having a huge amount of information. Um, the way that I've always described is like a weatherman. Uh, a weatherman can predict, uh, let's say, they can say three days from now, we're going to have severe weather outbreak because this warm front with this moist air is going to meet with this cold front, etc. 72 hours later, perfectly sunny and 70 degrees and nothing even looks like it could potentially be bad. He's predicting the future. And I think that we all can look into the future a bit by looking at all the pieces of the puzzle, putting as many in as we possibly can, and we can see the future. We really can see into the future. I've spent 35 years doing this research, um, hundreds of thousands of dollars, Travel all over the world. Oh my God! It's just, you know, the most unbelievable information. Um, I bet everybody listening to my voice right now knows there's in the back of their mind. They might not want to think about it, but they know there's something innately wrong that's going on in the United States and in the world. And what they don't want to have is no choices. Um, just like in in uh, Germany or all of Europe, there were rumors about what was going on. There are people going, I'll never leave. I'll never leave my home, my family, etc. But it got to be a point in time where it got so bad that it was life and death. It was a choice of life and death. And people that waited too long, they got caught behind the lines. Paper, please. Well, you don't have your papers. You never got out. Um, we all have some sort of insurance, whether whether it's insurance for our automobile just in case we're in a car accident, or we might have, uh, let's say, candles and a flashlight in the house just in case electricity goes off. Um, but it may never go off, but we still have them. We might have a gun in the house to protect our wife and children and daughter from being raped or an intruder or something like that. Uh, we might have freeze-dried food just in case martial law is called or, or something goes bad at the grocery store, right? Uh, we have insurance. Well, this information is truly life and death. Maybe people would get this information and they would never use it, just like buying a cookbook and never actually making one of the recipes. I think most people have done something like that. Uh, but if this is the most important information when it comes to life and death, uh, when it comes to uh, surviving, what I call the next five to 15 years on this planet, a lot of things that are coming down in a prophetic sort of way, all the world's religions, all of them, I've studied them in depth, uh, have a sort of what we'll call an end-time scenario. And almost all of them have very similar uh, uh, bloodbath, you know, massive amount of death on the planet scenarios before the Messiah returns or the Iman Mahdi, which is just uh, in an uproar over uh, in Iran right now, or the Lord Maitreya in the, in the fifth Buddha, uh, Christ coming back, Jesus coming back, the Messiah coming back for the Jews. All these scenarios are coming into play here, and, they're, and, and, and there are the potential for war, the potential for disease epidemics, the potential for famine and starvation, and huge amount of natural disasters, and ruthless governments um, taking uh, uh, away our freedoms and our, our right to have a, let's say, high quality of life. And I think that this information gives people uh, what they would know in the back of their mind I know where I'd need to go. I know why I'd want to go there. One, one, for every one person that left Europe, 21 stayed put and died in World War II. 79 million people died in World War II. I, I, 
I know a lot of people that are hunkering down. But this is my mindset, and I know this. I don't want to come across any way, shape, or form just being arrogant. But this is, this is what I believe. Let's say we're on the Titanic. We've been given this unbelievable spiel about this ship, okay? I mean, there's nothing in the world that's ever been built like it, etc. It's unsinkable. It's this, it's that, the other. The moment it hits the iceberg, there's probably only a few people on the entire Titanic that really know what's going to happen in the next few hours. They know for sure, 100% sure, that it's going to be at the bottom of the uh, North Atlantic, <laughs> deep, deep down there. Now, we've heard this story about, you know, people rearranging the deck chairs on, on the Titanic. Um, if, let's say, nautical engineers knew for sure that the Titanic was going down, we have hindsight because we know the Titanic, but if we knew for sure all the people saying, let's go bail water, let's take a boat, let's, uh, let's just wait and see, we gotta, we got to protect the Titanic. I mean, this is the Titanic. We, you know, I mean, it's not going down. I mean, this is too big to, to go down, right? Uh, we got to save the Titanic. All these sorts of things, we're going, you bet you don't understand. We have X amount of minutes. we got to get people in the lifeboats. we got to get off of this ship. It's going down. People looking at us going, you're abandoning ship? You're a chicken. You're yellow. You're, you're a coward. You're, you, you, you can't, they told us it can't possibly sink. And you're going, but I know for a fact it is. Now, 35 years of research, I've researched so much. I really do believe that the United States has been targeted by the globalists to be taken out. They just have. Um, the United States, as much as I love the United States and as much as I uh, have uh, a huge amount of feelings for the, for the United States, we're right now the big bully on the playground. Uh, we, we can kick sand in anybody's face. We can kick any of the kids uh, off of the swing set uh, that are smaller than us, etc. But to have a global governance, a new world order, to have the, 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 the type of system they want in the world, you can't have one big, huge bully going around invading countries and, and uh, assassinating people and killing people. You have to have this equal group of nations. I believe the United States is targeted. And I believe exactly what these people that do control um, the economies and, and, and global events in the world, they have targeted the United States for, for destruction. I'm absolutely convinced of it. And so I believe that you can hunker down here if you want to, and there will be a few people that will survive. But I believe 90% of the people in the United States that are alive today that stay here will be dead in the next 5 to 15 years. I absolutely am convinced of it. Well, let's take the planet that we live on and really do look at it. Let me give you some absolute flat-out statistics. This is absolute fact. 90% of the world's population lives in the northern hemisphere. 10% of the world's population lives in the southern hemisphere. 95% of all the pollution generated in the world is generated in the northern hemisphere and does not cross the equator that's called the Coriolis effect. All the air and all the water, I mean, like we're talking 99%, stays in its perspective hemisphere. It does not cross the hemisphere. Think about it. 5% of the world's pollution is in the southern hemisphere, but it's half of the planet. 85% of the world's rainforests that clean the air, that provide oxygen, are in the southern hemisphere. And it's only happened to clean out 5% of the world's pollution. Climates in the northern hemisphere are much more severe than the southern hemisphere. Any global climate change in the southern hemisphere, global climate change doesn't change much of anything. Severe changes in the northern uh, hemisphere. There is so many people in the northern hemisphere. There are tensions, war. Uh, there's fighting over the few resources. Um, it is completely different. In the southern hemisphere, it is quiet, tranquil, peaceful. I've been in a few places in, in southern Africa. It is a completely different way of life. And if you have another Fukushima or you have a nuclear war, all that is going to generate in the northern hemisphere, none of that, radiation, those isotopes, whether it's iodine-131 or uranium or plutonium or strontonium, none of that crosses the equator and goes to the southern hemisphere. So if there's nuclear war between the United States and China, the United States and Russia, or uh, Pakistan, things start getting out of hand, Pakistan, India, whatever, all that's going to cir circulate in the Northern Hemisphere. 
15 years ago. I uh, moved my wife and my two 